Well, thank you for being here. I'm excited as we wrap up this series on control, about control freaks. It's really a series about God's sovereignty, his control over everything, and how freaked out we get when we feel like we're not in control. Uh, and so we're going to wrap up the series today. It's based on this idea of God's sovereignty, and we've defined sovereignty this way, that God has the power and authority to do all, uh, to do or allow all that God desires to do or allow. Like he has complete power and authority to do or allow all God desires to do or allow. And that's, that, that we, we like that idea when, it, when, when we talk about it in terms of blessing and favor, because we like the idea that God has power and authority to bless and favor. And if God desires that, he does it, we like that. But we run into difficulties when we talk in terms of pain and trouble. Because if God has the power and authority to do all that God desires to do or allow, why would God desire to do or allow pain and difficulty? And so we like the idea of sovereignty, that God has power to do all the good stuff. It's difficult for us to come to terms with when we talk about the difficult stuff. Because if God has all power and authority to do all God desires to do or allow, why would he allow and do stuff that's not fun? Does that make sense? You understand? So last week I introduced this idea of these six stages that God takes his people through. From de- dream to deliverance. And so let me just remind you about what these are. We're going to talk about them again today. That God, when, when God gives a dream, when God gives a vision, when God pulls us to something, some, some, some profound desire, uh, some profound, oper- like we, we, all, we all have those dreams or have had them of life, of desire, of goals. And God oftentimes gives us a dream and then asks us to, to make a decision. Because a dream without a decision is just a wish. And, and this is how it works in the Bible. This is what God does. He gives us a dream, invites us to make a decision to follow him in that dream, and then he leads us through this stages of delay when stuff just slows down. I don't care what dream you've had, it's probably never gone as far or as fast as what you wanted it to at day one. It's just slower. And then from delay, he leads us into difficulties. Stuff just gets hard. It's harder than we thought it would be, takes longer than we thought it would take, costs us more than we thought we had to pay. It just gets hard. And then inevitably, God leads us to things called dead ends, where we have no more anything. It's a dead end. Stuff just stops. I got no more energy. I got no more, I got no more, more vigor for this thing. I, I got no options. It's just dead in the water. And God takes us through all of those things before he ever gets us to the stage of deliverance. All, we see it all the time in the Bible. If you think about it in your lives, you've felt that you've, you've been through these. And, but here's the problem. Most people jump off or jump out before they ever get to deliverance. Because they got this dream, they make a decision, they think, oh, this is going to be awesome. And then they hit a delay and they think, well, it shouldn't take this long, I'm out. Or they stay in through the delay and now it gets really, really hard and think, well, this is harder than I thought it would be, I'm out. Or they stick with it through the delay and the difficulty, now they hit a dead end. They think there's no way through this, no way around, no way over, and I'm out. And they jump shit before they ever get to deliverance. All of us have gone through the same process. Many of us has jumped off before deliverance ever came. And many of us question God's sovereignty when we hit those delays, difficulties, and dead ends. God, if you have all power and authority to do all that you desire to do and allow, why this? Right? I'm not afraid to start this all over again. You've got to give me something back here. Okay, I feel, I feel, sometimes I feel like I'm preaching better than you're listening. And so you, you need to you, you, you need to give me a little sum. You're listening hard. Well, respond harder. So, so here's what I know. See if this isn't true. Faith is easy when it's theory. And it's more difficult when it's up against a dead end. That was a better response. Thank you. So like, like, like we can talk about faith all day long. We can talk about dreams. We can talk about decisions all day. But the moment you hit a dead end, now it gets real and now it gets, now, now it's hard. Here's what I know. Part of what makes God smile is how we handle dead ends. Part of what makes God smile is how we handle dead ends. How do I know that? 
This is one of the reasons why God orchestrates and allows dead ends by his sovereignty in the lives of his followers. It's because it gives us an opportunity to respond with this thing called faith. Because here's what I know. Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it's impossible to what? To please God. To make God smile. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So but part of the reason God orchestrates dead ends and allows dead ends is to give us an opportunity to respond in faith. Because faith is the only way we make God smile. So those de- delays, difficulty, dead ends that we face, they may just be given. They may just be orchestrated by God to give you an opportunity to make Him happy. Not because you're hitting a rough spot, but because you have the opportunity then to respond in faith by faith. You, you understand? And so when we hit these delays, difficulties, and dead ends, and we jump off, we don't respond in faith, and God's like, "You missed it." I, I set you up, man. When we hit dead ends, faith has got to move from theory to practice. See, it's easy to say, if God is for me, who's against me? But when we face a dead end, it seems like even God is against us. See, it's easy to say, no weapon formed against me will stand. But when you're looking down the barrel of a dead end, huh? that's scary. See, it's easy to say that I believe in a God who parts the waters of the Dead Sea, but when I'm standing at the shore looking at the sea that isn't parted yet, something different. So faith is easy when it's theory. More difficult when you hit a dead end. But it's at the dead ends when faith comes alive like no other place in life. And because it's only by faith that we please God, dead ends are actually vital to our faith and to pleasing him. And dead ends are vital to seeing and experiencing miracles by God in our lives. Without dead ends, we cannot please him. Without dead ends, we do not see his hand move in miraculous ways. Here's what I know. If you study the Bible, You'll see God takes his people from dead end to dead end to dead end. Here's what I know. That if you study the Bible, you'll see God's people of old respond with faith at every dead end. And here's what I know. God sits back and smiles. But here's also what I know. If you study our lives, you will see that God takes us from dead end to dead end to dead end. And here's also what I know, that if you study our lives, most often we respond with fear and doubt and worry. And God doesn't smile. Last week we looked at the account of Moses as he led the people of Israel out of captivity in Egypt, out of slavery, straight in to the dead end of the Dead Sea. All by God's sovereign design, he lined it up that way. This week, we're going to look at Joshua, who is now the new leader of the nation of Israel after Moses led them out of captivity. Now they've gone through the desert, and now God, by his sovereignty, is leading the people through Joshua to another dead end, at another body of water. Very similar accounts. Moses leads the people to the dead end of the Dead Sea, Joshua leads the people through the dead end of the Jordan River. Now we got to be very careful. Teach a little bit about God. We got to be very careful in thinking that because God moved this way this time, God's going to move the same way next time. We we, we think that because God did it this way that time, God's going to do it this way the next time. Let me tell you something God is always original. He always is original. The devil isn't original at all. The devil just recycles the same old plan. Every The devil just copies God. God's original. God always comes true, but it's always in a different way. And so our problem is when we run up against the delays, difficulties, and dead ends, we think, well, God did it that way this time, so that's what I'm watching for. I'm watching for that thing this time. God, I don't know anywhere in the Bible where God did the exact same thing two times in a row. 
He's, I mean, when he healed people of blindness, he got so creative. One time he spit on the ground and made mud and put it on a poor guy's eyes. The guy was blind. So he obviously didn't know Jesus just spit on the ground. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, that's kind of nasty. He had never done it that way before. And when the guy's telling the story, he tells the story, Jesus put mud on my eyes. He had no idea how that happened. Like, like, like it, 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 God, it, he doesn't have to do stuff the same way. So we, we start watching for, well, how do you, what did you do last time? That's what I'm going to expect. And, we, and so here they are for, for this body of water. And, and this is how it goes down. Joshua chapter 3. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they, they camped before crossing over. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. So, 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 so Joshua's leading the people, leads them to the Dead Sea, uh, to the Jordan River, and the Bible tells the, the, the river's at flood stage during this time. Now, God in his sovereignty, just think, 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 think biblically and historically for a minute with me. God in his sovereignty took the nation, uh, took his people out of the nation of Egypt to the dead end of the Dead Sea, and then he parted the waters so they went from the dry ground of the shore to the dry ground of parted waters and water. None of them got their feet wet. Right? And that's how it worked back then. So now God in his sovereignty does a very similar thing in getting them to the, he gets them to the edge of the promised land and takes them up to the dead end of a river at flood stage. What do you think is going through the people's minds? How are we going to get across it? What's going through their minds? Oh, yeah, what's going through their minds is, okay, we've been here before. Like, we went to the Dead Sea. There's no way across. God parted it. It's all good. Thinking God's going to do it the exact same way. You, you know what the Jordan River is normally like without harvest, without flood stage? It's, it's a long, but it's, it may be at its widest point. Um, and it's not very wide at all at any point, but at some points it might be, you know, 80, 90 feet. I've been there. Uh, and, and it's, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not like the real ground, you know, I mean, it's just, and, and most of it's pretty shallow. There might be pools in it that might be nine, 10, but like a swimming pool deep. And, and so it's, but at flood stage. Around harvest time. Right when God in his sovereignty, when he took the people to the river to cross it. It's well over 100 feet wide. And vastly deeper than 10 feet. And so I've got this video I want to show you of, of, of what it could have potentially been like. Now, we don't know because that was a long time ago and they didn't have cell phones to take selfies back then. But, but as, as best we know, this is pretty similar to what the Jordan River was like at flood stage. You can imagine how much they would want God to part it before they got to step in it, right? Can you imagine having to wade that thing? Here's what I know, and we, we got to understand this. When God leads us to a dead end, we cannot guess what his instructions will be. He's so creative. There's no way that we can outguess God and what he's going to ask of us when we're looking at a dead end. But what we do know, is that it will always involve an act of faith. Always. Would it have been any faith at all had Joshua and the priest walked up to the, to the Jordan River 
And based on what the new God did last time, they say, God, go ahead, and God just part it, and they walk across. Would that take any faith at all? So here's, let me just say this. Whatever you know that God did last time, you can pretty much bank he ain't going to do it the exact same this time because it takes no faith to follow when all he does is copy himself. Now, what he does do every time is deliver. But he always does it in a way that makes us act in faith. So God's instructions at water's edge. Here it is. God through jo jo Joshua. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, y'all go and stand in a river. You saw what the river was like. When you get up to the edge... Y'all carry an ark of covenant. Go on and step on in. Ha! <laughs> act of faith? You're darn skippy an act of faith. You saw that thing. See, God in his sovereignty takes the kids he loves to dead ends and then in his sovereignty asks his kids to take steps of faith that will always test their faith. Ain't gonna be easy. But before he gets us to dead ends, he gives us a dream and an invitation to make the decision to follow him in that. And then orchestrates and allows delays and difficulties that get us to the dead ends. Why? Why would God give us a dream, we make a decision to follow, and then lead us down the path of delay, difficulty, and dead? Why? I'm going to tell you why. Because God's ultimate purpose and priority is not our comfort and ease. God's ultimate purpose and priority is our faith in him and honoring him by faith. All through the Bible, we see this process. I guarantee you, you look at your life, you see this in your life. There's a dream and there's a decision. For Joshua, it was the dream of the liberation of God's people in the inhabiting of the promised land. And Joshua made the decision to follow God in that dream. And he eventually became the leader of the nation of Israel, taking them into the promised land. It looked like this way back in the day in Joshua's life. From Numbers chapter 14, Joshua, son of Nun, he didn't have a mom or a dad, <laughs> I'm just kidding. And Caleb, son of Jephunneh who were among those who explored the land. Okay, so Moses, in looking, at like, let's go, let's, we're getting ready to go into the promised land. Let's send some spies in there, like this is good military stuff, to find out what it is we're walking into so we're not surprised. And so he gets 12 men, one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and sends them in. And the 12 come back, and 10 of them are petrified. Two of them are like, no, 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 no. This is God's dream, let's decide to go. Those two guys are Joshua and Caleb. They tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, how do we make God pleased with us? By, by faith. If we act in faith, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only don't rebel against the Lord by backing out before he brings deliverance. And don't be afraid of the people of that land, man, because we'll devour them. Their protection's gone. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. And so Joshua makes this, he says, I see the dream, God. You gave it to Moses. I seen it too. I agree with it too. You've called me, and I, I'm, I'm going to make the decision to follow. Even if everybody else backs, I'm going to make the decision to follow you in this dream of the, of the promise. And that's dream and decision. And now... Joshua takes leadership. Moses is dead. And Joshua runs into, after the decision, what? Delay. Runs into delay. And so leads him to the, prom the edge of the promised land of the Jordan River. The Bible tells us it's early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. So they're right at the edge. It's like, like all we got to do is get a look like right there. It's like right there. Like, let's go, right? After three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. 
when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way. This is brand new for you. You don't know what you're doing. Keep a distance of about a thousand cubits between you and the ark. Don't go. Here's what he's saying. I've given you my dream. You've made a decision to follow. And now I've got to put the brakes on you. Your, your temptation is to run ahead of me. Your temptation is to push this faster than what I want you to go. And so he says, I want you to wait like three days. Just take a break. Slow it down. Put the brakes on. He said, I want you to go slow because you've never gone this way before. So don't rush me in this. He says, don't press me. Don't push me. When he says, you stay back 2,000, that's over half a mile. He said, you put some space between what I'm doing and where you are. Just slow down. God says, look, I'm doing something in you more than just giving you new territory. So back off a little bit. Have it, has God ever had you just back off something for a little bit? Just give me some space, God says. Slow down. Some, some of you are close talkers. You, you like getting right up in someone's face when you talk. You know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and, 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 and some of us have a wide berth of personal space we like to keep. <laughs> And I think God is both of those. God likes the right here. But sometimes God's like, y'all need to back off a little bit. Give me room to work. And so he's telling them, I'm going to put you in a delay season right now. You just back off a little bit and wait. And so they do. They back off. They slow down. You can't get ahead of God. And Joshua tells his priest, hey, this is what's going to go down. And it moves from delay, just wait. Give me some space. It moves to what? Remember? Difficult. Not dead in yet. You got to get through difficult first. It moves to difficulty. Stuff gets hard. And so Joshua tells him, tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go ahead and step in it. Well, now you saw what the Jordan was like. Step in that. And as soon as the priest who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will uh, be cut off and stand up in a heap. Okay, you no, know, no, wait a minute. Let's think what, what, what's gone down here in these people's lives. When, when Moses walked through the desert and got to the Dead Sea, all Moses had to do was hold out his staff over the Dead Sea. And the Bible says a wind blew all night long. Moses just stood there. I'm sure drinking coffee so he could stay awake the whole night. And then the wind blew and the water split. And they just walked across on dry ground. But these poor priests, they're told, carry this big old heavy box and y'all step in the river. Can you imagine? They're, they're probably like, okay, time out, time out here. Moses, he wasn't even carrying nothing. Like he had a stick. And all he had to do was stand there and hold like this and just wait a little while and feel the wind blow and watch the water and then just what? What? Y'all watch Stranger Things? Yeah, you're going to admit that in church? Yeah. Y'all watch it. I mean, like, I'm sure the thing, why, why can't you just do an L thing? Ah! You know, and then it just split and you just were good. See, stuff just got difficult for them. Right? How are they even going to get down the bank carrying that? They're not allowed to touch that. They got to put it, carry it on poles. So how are we going to carry these four guys on poles and walk down the bank and, without falling in? But God isn't done with them. He's taking them through delay. He's taking them to difficulty. He's not done yet. Because he's got to take him to a what? You got to take him to a dead end still. And so God tells him. Just notice what the Bible says. God said, step in. The waters will be cut off and stop flowing. 
So, in their minds, if God tells you, look, you, you go to this river and then step in it, and then the waters are going to be cut off, and they'll walk across on dry ground. What, what do you expect is going to happen? You're going to walk in and step in a water. The moment I step in, the water's going to stop, and I'm going to walk across. Because that's what God said, right? I want you to get how this played out. Their expectation based on what they've seen and based on the, the exact words God said, is that I'm going to step in, the waters are going to cut off, and we're going to walk across. Their expectation is going to happen right now, right here. Because that's what God said. Step in, water's cut off, walk across. Right. But what does the Bible really say? Let's see. Verses 15 through 16. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. Just like God said. Yeah, but, 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 well, watch now. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam. Now, what God said was, you step in, the waters will stop, and you'll walk across on dry ground. That's what they, that's what God told them in their ears. The narrative behind the story that they weren't told is that yes, indeed, the waters will be cut off, but it's going to be upstream, not anywhere you are near where you are. Do you see the dilemma? They stepped in, the water was cut off, just not where they were. When you read the account and you think about it, it seems as though God wasn't completely transparent with them. It's like God was holding back some pretty important information because God did not tell them. Now, step in the water and just be patient. I'm doing stuff that you can't see. Step in the water. It's going to be cut off 12 miles upstream at this place called Adam. You won't see it happen for a while. Know that I'm doing something. He didn't say, it'll take a little while for the water to stop flowing. Know that it has stopped. You just haven't experienced it. But know that I've done what I've said. Just be patient and have faith. He didn't say, I'm doing something at a place you cannot see. It's going to take a little while for you to actually see the blessing of it. He didn't say that. Why didn't he? I mean, this is what we want from him, isn't it? We hit some delay, difficulty, dead end, and we would love for God to say, okay, Carl, here's the deal. Like, I'm doing, I'm going to do A, I'm going to do B, I'm going to do, I'm going to skip over D, I'm going to get to E, and then I'm going to, this is my plan, that we would love for him to tell us that, right? Like, I know you hit a, a dead end right now in your career. I know your marriage is hitting some real difficulty. I know that your kids are, and, but, but listen, I'm doing something. I'm going to take you here, I'm going to take you here, I'm going to take you here, and eventually I'm going to get you, we would love for him to tell us that. Why doesn't he? Yeah, because if he said, I'm going to do A, B, C, we're like, okay, good. There's no faith in that, right? So God tells us enough to know deliverance is coming, but he doesn't give us all the details to know exactly where his hand is moving at every given time. So we have to stand there in the middle of the river, a raging river, by faith. See, from their perspective, all they had was a dead end. But all God was doing was giving them an opportunity to walk in faith, not sight. He was giving them an opportunity to make him smile. Here's what I know. This is really important. Sometimes God takes us through dead ends into deliverance pretty immediately. It might take a night. Water parted. God does it quick. We can see the feel the wind. We know something's moving. We can see God orchestrated, and it's, it all makes sense. Other times, God's deliverance takes time. This is what I came up with. You got to stand in it while you wait for it. You got to stand in the middle of the dead end while you're waiting for deliverance. You're not going to see it. You're not going to feel it. You're not going to know by fact, because I've seen A, B, C, that you know that you know. You, you're just going to have to stand in it while you're waiting for it. But what I do know 
because of who God is and what God always does is that when you stand in it while waiting for it, God finally brings deliverance. This is what he does. And this is what he did. The water from upstream stopped flowing. It just piled up 12 miles away. The water flowing down to the Sea of Araba, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people eventually crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on what? Was it dry when they stepped in? Was it dry when they walked through the middle of it? Here's what I know. God can lead you to a dead end and provide deliverance simultaneously. You just have to stand in it while you wait for it. They crossed on dry ground, but their feet got wet in the process. They had to stand in the middle of what they saw as a dead end because God was orchestrating something that they couldn't see. If you want to be a leader, I'm going to tell you this. You want to be a leader. You got to be the tip of the spear. It took no faith for the ones in the back of the group to walk across on what was already dry ground. It took tremendous faith to be the priest to step in the raging river and to stand there and continue taking steps, waiting for the water to stop flowing. You want to follow God? You want to see miracles in your life? You want to be a leader? You got to be at the tip of the spear. You don't lead from the back. Men, listen to me. Husbands, fathers, listen to me. You especially have got to be, we especially got to be the tip of the spear. Our wives are meant to follow. Our children are meant to follow. We're meant to lead. Amen. Tip of the spear. You understand? Amen. They just had to have faith and act in that faith before seeing what God had already said in motion. So this may be where you are. Stand on the banks of a raging river. You're trying to muster enough faith to follow God in the middle of this dead end. You're the tip of the spear. You got a family that doesn't understand what you're doing. Doesn't understand the changes that are going on in your life. You're the tip of the, you stand in that thing while you wait for it. I don't know where you are in this process. Some of you are just now getting a dream of God. Just imagining what God can do through a submitted life. And you're just on the verge of saying, God, I'm going to commit. I'm going to make the decision to follow you wherever you lead. For my friends Nick and Solgo, led them to St. George, Utah. It's awesome. Some of you are at this delay stage. And, and, and what it, whatever it is in your life, it's just taking long. You're just in a holding pattern. You're wanting to move. You're wanting to go forward. You're wanting for the dam to break. You're wanting for something to, and you're just told to wait. And you've been waiting a long time. Wonder when deliverance is going. Some of you are at a difficulty and stuff has just gotten really, really hard. You're not at the end of your, of your rope, but you're almost there. It's just hard. Like when you started following, when you first said, decided to follow, like it wasn't this hard. There was more hope, and right now there's just more obstacles. It's just hard right now. Some of you are at a dead end. And you're looking at whatever that thing is, thinking there's, there's no way through this. If I could get out, I would. I just can't, I can't find a way to get out yet. I can't go around, can't go, can't go. Like I'm just, I'm stuck. I just, want, I just want out. I, I don't know where you are in that process. I know you're somewhere. And I want you to realize this and understand this, that deliverance is coming as long as you don't back out or back away. That deliverance is coming. You might not see it at the moment. It might be a way upstream. It's coming. 
It might look different than what you thought it would be. It might be different than what you hoped it would be. It might be different than where, where, what it was when you started. But it's coming. Move in faith and stand in faith. Because God has already orchestrated your deliverance if you don't back out and back away from him. And it's in that faith that God smiles. And it's in that faith that God takes great delight. And it's in that faith that God always rewards. Deliverance is coming. Do you understand that? Don't back away. And don't back out. So today, I'll give you an opportunity to make four commitments as we wrap up this series. The first is this. Commit to submitting to God's sovereignty. Like whatever, wherever that sovereignty has led you, to a dream, to a decision, to a delay, to a difficulty, to a dead end, just commit to submitting to a sovereignty. God, you know I submit to your sovereignty. I'll make a decision to follow you. God, you've led me to a delay. I trust you. You go your time frame, not mine. I'm going to submit. God, you can live and do it, get difficulty. It's a lot harder than I thought it would be. But I trust your sovereignty. God, I'm staring at a dead end. Never thought I'd be here. But I'm going to stand in it while I wait for it. I'm going to submit to your sovereignty. Because I know that by your sovereignty, deliverance is coming. So the first thing is just simply submit to God's sovereignty. The second thing is to commit to walking in and walking by faith, not by sight. Quit letting what you see in your life right now dictate your future. Walk by faith, not by sight. Father, I don't see it, but I know. If I based what I, my life on what I saw, deliverance is a long way off. But by faith, I know it's coming. Because it's by faith that you please him. You understand that? The third thing is this. My friend J.D. told me this many years ago. If you're doing something stupid, stop it. <laughs> it's pretty biblical advice. Sometimes we get delays, difficulties, dead ends because we're stupid. And we're doing stupid stuff. The Bible calls it sin. So if you're doing stupid stuff, stop it. And your commitment is, Father, I'm sorry. Sin in my life, I'm sorry. I've been stupid for a long time. Forgive me of my sin. The fourth thing is this. Choose to do things God's way. Choose to do it his way. God, I've tried my way long enough. As, as, as autumn as it might say, you might take me to tell me to step in a region. I'm going to do it your way. And know that your deliverance is coming. It's coming. I want you to pray with me. I'm going to walk through these four commitments if there's one or all of them you want to make in your own words, I invite you in this moment to say, Father, I'm going to submit to your sovereignty. And if by your sovereignty you're leading me to a delay, if by your sovereignty you lead me to a difficulty, if by your sovereignty you've taken me for a dead end, Father, I'm going to submit to it. I'm not going to kick against you anymore. I give you permission. I'm going to back off. Put me in a season of delay. Put me in a season of difficulty. Put me in a season of death. If that's what brings about your deliverance, Father, I submit. Make this commitment. Tell him, Father, I, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to I'm walk by faith. I've let what I've seen dictate who I know you to be, and I'm sorry. By faith, I'm going to trust. By faith, I'm going to follow. By faith, I'm going to believe. Tell him, Father, <laughs> between me and you, God, I, I admit I've been doing stupid stuff that I know I shouldn't. It's cut off my conversation with you. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you that you love me regardless of that, but I'm sorry because I've allowed my sin to interfere with my relationship with you. I confess it before you. Forgive me. And then tell him, God, best I know how, I'm going to do it your way. 
as best as I know how. If you call me to step in a river, I'm going to be scared to death, but I'm going to do it. You call me to stand in it while I wait for it, I'm going to get impatient at times, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it your way. Because I know that my deliverance is coming. I know what your word says. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. The parter of seas. The stopper of waters. I'm going to do it your way. Because I know that my deliverance is coming. Father, some of us in this place have made those commitments today. Father, I pray for us that you would remind us that through the dream, through the decision, through the delay, through the difficulty, and even in the midst of dead ends, that you've promised deliverance. And I thank you that the deliverance lasts longer than any of the others. If we're in delay, deliverance lasts longer. If we're at difficulties, deliverance lasts longer. If we're at dead ends, Father, we know that deliverance lasts longer. And so this morning we are yours. Bring your deliverance. Let the waters not overtake us. Bring your deliverance. We trust you and we submit to your sovereignty. Amen.